Hello and welcome to the Reviews Brothers. This time round we are back on the Commodore 64 to check out a bunch of games that are based on movies. Oh boy. As you can imagine, there are loads of them on the system and they really do vary wildly in quality and I've got a bunch of them for us to look at here. Of course, I can't cover every single one of them in this video, so make sure you let us know what games we should cover if we do a part two of the subject. And of course, don't forget to subscribe. We've got loads of cool videos that you won't want to miss. And I also want to give a shout out to Nalasco and of course the rest of you for all the support that the channel has been getting recently. We really appreciate it and we love reading your comments and game suggestions so please make sure you keep them coming. Anyway, how about I shut the hell up and we take a look at some games in roughly alphabetical order. First up is The Addams Family from Ocean. There is a version of this on just about every 8 and 16 bit system out there, but this one actually plays quite differently. It's a side scrolling action game where you play as Gomez, exploring the Adams mansion, hunting for keys and finding your missing family members. The game looks decent with some cool graphics and animation and there's a ton of different rooms to explore and enemies to kill, which you do so by jumping on their heads, but be careful as the hit detection is not perfect and you can only take one hit before you snuff it. Thankfully, you never get set back too far if you do die. As it's an ocean game though, it is just hard as balls, which unfortunately does take a fair bit away from the enjoyment. It's not an impossible game and can probably be classed as one of their easier ones in all honesty, but having to learn the layout of the mansion coupled with the rooms that sometimes have no escape other than death can feel pretty cheap and annoying. The controls however are surprisingly good, so at least you get a sort of fair chance. If you're a fan of action platform games, then give this one a try, but don't expect an easy ride. Next up is Aliens, based on the amazing Ridley Scott film. Of course, here you take control of six squad members, Ripley, Gorman, Hicks, Bishop, Vasquez and Burke, and you have to escape the hostile alien planet with as many members of the team as possible. The game is played from a first person perspective and you control the crosshair, which you can use to of course blast aliens as well as destroy doors or their locking mechanisms if you're being chased so the alien can't follow you through. What's cool here is that you can switch between the characters whenever you want and you'll need to do this to make sure they stay alive. You'll get an alert if an alien is near one of your characters and you'll need to switch to them and either try and kill the alien before it gets you or run away and hide. This is a really cool mechanic when you get used to it and it can make the game pretty tense as you can hear your motion tracker going off when something is nearby. I really like the graphics here and everything runs very smoothly, though as you'd expect it's not an easy game and you'll quickly run out of ammo while exploring more than 200 rooms trying to find the exit. Also as you explore your party gets tired which forces you to constantly switch between the characters so they can recoup a bit. The number by each character tells you what room they're in, and basically you just want to get that number as high as possible and eventually you'll escape. I've never managed to actually escape with any characters, but I really like coming back to try again and again. This is one of those games that we had growing up, and it's just as hard now as it was back then, but I do highly recommend checking it out. And there's another Aliens game based on the same movie, but this time it's made by Activision, so it's often referred to as Aliens Activision. And this is a freaking awesome game, once you get past the first level at least. It follows the plot of the movie pretty damn closely and gives you a variety of levels to play through and some pretty cool cutscenes. You start by guiding your dropship to the surface of the planet, which for me was actually the hardest part of the game. The controls were decent enough, but you have to guide your ship through rings, but it just got so fast that I ended up passing just by dumb luck and not skill. But once you do get past that, you've got a great variety of action stages where you control your squad of marines as you explore various parts of the colony, having gunfights with aliens. Much like the last game, you often have to switch characters to stop them being overrun while you find your car. Later on you'll have to navigate through a vent maze like in the movie and stop an onslaught of aliens while your team cuts through a door to escape. The action here is really great and every level plays well. It does look a little basic but once you get playing you soon forget that. 
My main complaint here though are the sound effects, which are just a bit crappy. But let's face it, if that's the worst I can say about the game, it must be doing something right. Definitely check this one out, whether you're a fan of the movies or not. Batman the movie now from Ocean, who are going to show up a lot here. This is based on the 1989 Tim Burton movie, and I'm assuming it follows the plot of the movie, but I'll be honest, I couldn't get past the first level, even with cheats. You of course play as Batman, and the game looks decent, starting you out in the chemical plant where you have to explore a huge maze-like level, taking out enemies with your batarangs, which you do have an infinite supply of. You can also use your bat grappling hook to climb and swing to other sections. The problem for me though was just that I never knew where the hell I was meant to be going and there's no indication and of course you get a very short time limit. And the biggest issue was that you're able to take full damage. Often you don't know what's going to be a small drop or a large drop so I would end up dying loads and then just wandering around aimlessly. This is a common theme for ocean games I found, poor level design and cheap difficulty to compensate for games that are only 4 or 5 levels long. It's a shame, as the game does actually look really good, and it doesn't play too badly, though the collision detection is pretty crappy, but this could have been a great game. I'm almost tempted to say that it's not bad and I just suck, but I really didn't have fun in the 30 minutes or so it took me to not even beat the first level, however if it looks like something that you'll enjoy, give it a go, at least it's got Batman in it. Here is Beverly Hills Cop, which is one of my favourite movies of the 80s. Sadly, the game is one of the worst on the list here. It starts out with one of the worst driving sections I've ever played, where you explore a town looking for your mission. But the controls here are so terrible that making any turn is almost impossible, and if you hit anything, it's back to the start of the level you go. Also, your car is green, not the awesome red one that Axe actually has in the movie, so what the hell. If you do manage to get past the awful driving level, you're treated to some pretty awful action stages, where you make your way through some boring levels, avoiding basically unavoidable traps, and attempting to fight enemies with some of the worst collision detection I've ever seen. The controls actually aren't too bad. You hold the action button, and then each direction is a different attack, which is actually the theme for most of the action in these games, but it just seems random if you actually make any hits with anything. The graphics here are also quite ugly, and while I don't expect it to actually look like Axel Foley, if you were to see screenshots of the game, the last thing you'd say is that it's a Beverly Hills Cop game. This is definitely one you need to avoid. Big Trouble in Little China is another awesome movie from the 80s that got a terrible game, which isn't really a shock. Here you take control of all three of the main characters as you make your way from right to left which is immediately confusing and goes against all laws of gaming. You slowly make your way through the levels fighting countless enemies with some really bad control and hit detection. You can switch between the characters at any point and they each have their own movesets and life bars. Certain characters are better suited to fighting certain enemies which could have been cool but really with the shoddy control and hit detection it just doesn't matter. You occasionally find health and weapon power-ups which do help, but most of the time you'll find that the random traps in the background are completely unavoidable, taking damage is just something that you'll have to deal with. The enemy AI is also brain dead, they just sit there doing one attack over and over again which basically forces you to take hits and it's more of a battle of endurance than skill. In fact, I'd say that just playing this game is more of a battle of endurance, so do yourself a favour and just watch the movie, but stay far, far away from this game. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure does a valiant attempt following the plot of the movie and almost pulls it off. Yeah, you play as Bill and Ted in this puzzle adventure where you have to explore various time periods, figuring out how to get the people you need for your history port to join you. Beware though, you do actually need the manual for this game as you have to physically enter the time periods that you want to go to on the phone using the keyboard on the C64, which actually does make sense. Then you get to see some of the worst digitised screenshots while the game loads. 
Then each time period is a different puzzle. There's mazes, brain teasers, and basic fetch quests being required depending on the character you're trying to recruit. These are often annoyingly cryptic, as you'd expect from a game from this period, and in the case of the maze level, the exit of the maze is actually hidden, and I had to look up a guide to actually find where it was. But yeah, this is one of those games that once you know where you're going and what to do, you can actually beat the whole thing in about 10 minutes. But is it actually good or bad? Well, the graphics are pretty crappy and a bit basic, the controls are okay and work well enough, and the gameplay itself is actually quite interesting. It's just that nothing feels polished or even coherent, which is never a good combination. So while I don't think it's a particularly good game, this is one that I can kind of see what they were going for, and you can tell that there is some potential in here. If you want a game with crazy characters that deals with time travel, maybe play Day of the Tentacle on the PC instead, and give this one a miss. Bogus. Oh boy, here we go. Back to the Future, a movie series that is almost infamous for its bad games as it is famous for the good quality of the movies. This one here is based on the first game and it just sucks. You control Marty McFly and you explore a whopping five locations looking for various items that you have to use at the right time and place to make sure that your parents bang. But Biff is out to get you and you've got to stop yourself from shagging your own mum too. Thankfully that isn't a mini game. The whole game here is just a confusing mess. It's got terrible graphics and controls, and nothing seems to do what it's meant to, and most of the time you just have no idea what's happening. The colours of the character portraits at the bottom of the screen let you know if the items you have can be used, or if they're actually going to be effective, but no matter what I did, nothing seemed to make sense. I looked up a guide, and I honestly couldn't see what they were doing that I wasn't, and considering that I was reading the game manual before playing, which literally tells you what you need to do to complete the game, and I still couldn't beat it, surely that can't be all me being shit. So yeah, if you need to see how this one pans out, I'd say go look up a let's play, as it can be beaten in about 5 minutes when you know what to do. That's if the game lets you do it of course. Utter garbage. Back to the Future 2 also get a game, which is miles better than the first one, but it's still kind of crap. Here you play as Marty, and you start off spending your time on a hoverboard exploring the streets of the year 2015, punching anyone else that dares have a hoverboard. You have to avoid other obstacles and enemies, and of course cars, but even though the controls are actually quite good, and the music, I have to say, is awesome, the gameplay is just kind of boring and the level seems to drag on. Thankfully though, I managed to get through it, and the second level was actually a really cool puzzle, where you have to control the doors of a future 2015 house, and clear a path for your missus, whose name I can't remember or can't be bothered to look up, to escape the house without the cops getting her. This took me a few tries to figure out, but honestly it was actually a lot of fun. Unfortunately though, the next level was a side-scrolling game that reminded me a hell of a lot of Beverly Hills Cop, and they'd ain't a good thing. And while it was definitely better than that, it still wasn't particularly enjoyable. Of all the three Back to the Future games on the C64 though, this is definitely the best one by far, but that's not saying a huge amount. However, there is some fun to be had here, despite my moaning. Back to the Future 3 just plain sucks. It's another game that has a bunch of different playstyles, none of which control well or are even any fun. The first one sees you playing as Doc Brown, which is actually a nice change, as you ride your horse to rescue your fair lady. Is her name Cassandra, or am I making that up? No, that's from Wayne's World. I can't remember what this one's name is. Anyway, the controls here are just as bad as the previous games, and you have no time to avoid enemies or obstacles. When you get through that, you play a gallery shooter, and it's just as boring as you'd think it would be, and you have to score a certain number of points to move on. It's dull. Then you've got to throw pies at cowboys in a section that has some of the most awful controls I've ever experienced, making it almost impossible to finish. And then finally, you're riding a train and you've got to collect items to stop it from crashing. But this is almost impossible as you have no time to react from the pylons that will smash you in the face. And that's literally the whole game. My advice is just to stay as far away from this one as possible. It really is one of the worst games I've played on the C64.
Next up is Cobra, based on the Sylvester Stallone film that originally started out as a Beverly Hills Cop movie, until Sly decided to rewrite the script and make it a movie that's about as good as this game. And this game is total ass buckets. You play as Sly Stallone's Cobra character, which of course looks nothing like him, and you make your way through some side-scrolling levels killing hordes of bad guys and pregnant women, as you do. Now the game doesn't actually look too bad, but it plays terribly. It's stupidly difficult, even though you can take a few hits before you die. The controls here are poor, and of course the hit detection sucks. I could barely make it past the first few stages, and I was really trying. I can't imagine the game gets any better though, so I'm really not fussed by that. It's probably still better than Back to the Future 3 though. Cool World is another game from Ocean, and it's based on a movie that gets very mixed reviews. I've never seen the movie, so have no idea if it's any good, but the game here is actually surprisingly enjoyable. It's about a bloke who gets sucked into a cartoon world and has to stop the evil cartoon characters from crossing over into the real world and causing all kinds of havoc. So the aim of the game here is pretty much just that. You spend your time switching between the real world and the cartoon world, defeating cartoon enemies that have made it into the real world, and returning real world items that have been brought through into the cartoon world. Does that make sense? It's actually really fun. You've got a red and blue indicator bar that lets you know what's going on in each world, and the coloured squares show how many things that aren't meant to be in each world are present, and if it gets too much, then you lose. The controls here are decent, and the graphics do the job, but aren't anything to write home about. Though there is some good animation, but no music, just sound. But you know what, that's fine. You can shoot enemies to defeat them, and they'll turn into ink blobs that you can then suck up to finish them off. Thankfully, you also get a map at the bottom of the screen that shows you where the items and enemies that you need to sort out are. The whole thing was just really addictive and fun to play, and I really couldn't believe how long I ended up playing it for. It is an ocean game, so it still has some of their annoying difficulty spikes and shite timer, but overall this is a decent game that I would recommend checking out. Die Hard Now, and there's a good few Die Hard games for various systems that are all very different. Here you're playing as John McClane of course as you explore Nakatomi Plaza, taking down terrorists and rescuing hostages. Graphically, I actually quite like the way it looks. It's got a decent amount of animation in there too. The area you get to explore is also pretty large and you'll need to find keys and weapons to stay alive. You can fight enemies using your fists with the standard C64 combat here by holding down the action button and then pressing a different direction for different attacks. But along the way you'll also find guns which definitely helps as the hit detection isn't great. And some of the enemies that aren't armed will even run away if they see you with a gun. That's a really nice touch. There's loads of rooms to explore, many of which are of course locked. Thankfully you're told if you need a key or an access code, but actually finding these can be really tough, especially as the layout of the building is very confusing. There are maps you can look at that are dotted around, and there's arrows on the floor to show you where exits are, but I still found actually navigating the corridors really confusing, and I couldn't tell if I was going around in circles, or if there's just a lot of similar looking rooms most of the time. Having said that though, I actually did enjoy playing this one, and the actual design and premise have a lot of promise in there. It's definitely not perfect, but I would actually recommend giving this one a go if you can. You might have better navigational skills than me, and hopefully we'll get a bit of fun out of it. Die Hard 2 is a rail shooter that plays basically the same as all other rail shooters you've played before, but that doesn't really mean it's a bad thing. You control a cursor on screen and use it to shoot enemies as well as the highly destructible environments. This is worth doing as you'll find health kits, ammo and new weapons hidden throughout. The game looks decent enough, though there's not much in the way of variety of enemies. They do animate well though, and everything runs smoothly, which you'll notice I like. You'll recognise the locations from the movie for the most part too. You do have to watch out for civilians and policemen who must insist on running into your line of fire, kill one of these and you'll lose some health, but thankfully this game is actually pretty decent and generous with health power-ups, unlike a lot of games like this, so you do get a fair chance. The other weapons you also get are also pretty good, you get pistols, machine guns and uzis that all have different firing rates and clip sizes, and you'll get a few missiles and grenades in there for good measure, these are good for clearing a busy room. 
and really that's all there is to the game. Each level lasts about 5 minutes and has some form of boss, either as a big bugger or a number of smaller tougher enemies, but it's a bit of fun that is worth a play if you need to kill some time or need all things die hard. Here is Elvira the Arcade Game. Most people told me to play the two adventure games, not this one, and I did, but to be honest I couldn't figure out how to change the disc on Vice, so I only got about 10 minutes in, so I'll definitely have to go back to those another time. Anyway, Elvira the Arcade Game is a side-scrolling action game where you can choose from a whopping two levels, either fire or ice, and you have to fight your way through loads of persistent monsters who just want to motorboat you, and can you blame them? You have a knife as well as magic spells that you can use to defend yourself, and these work well enough. You also have a fairly good jump, though it is very hard to consistently get the angles right. I find that you sort of stop halfway through your jump and then just go straight down, which often leads to you landing in lava or icy water. Graphically, the game is fine, you can tell that it's Elvira, and some of the enemy designs are pretty cool, and the levels themselves look alright, if a little blocky. The controls are also okay, they're pretty responsive, and it's one of those games where you have to wait for animations to finish before you can start doing anything else, which does often mean that you'll take damage when you really shouldn't be. The biggest issue I had with the game though is just that the spells didn't always seem to work, which meant I got stuck behind doors that just wouldn't open, and also there's a lot of blind jumps that end up with you landing in deadly pits, but there's no way of getting out of them. This got very frustrating, and it was just kind of hard to finish even just one of the levels. Also, the game go through so many needless loading screens, I did sometimes wonder even if there was a game in here. Overall though, it's not the worst game I've played, in fact, it's one of the more enjoyable ones on this list, but I would say that it's a tough one to recommend still. I'll have to get Vice Manual out and see about changing those discs so I can properly check out the adventure games instead for the next time. Now here's the one you've all been waiting for, E.T. Puzzle. This is a completely pointless game that is literally what it says on the tin. It's one of those picture slide puzzles where you have to make a picture of E.T. You use the numbers on your keyboard that correspond to the square location to move them around until it's complete. I really hate these puzzles in real life, so a boring, slow, ugly virtual one really just doesn't appeal to me. And honestly, that's all there is to the game. It's a total waste of everyone's time. Now, I am going to assume that this was probably made by one bloke as just a bit of fun, but still, it's not one you need to bother with. This one can go home. The Evil Dead is a game that I've tried a few times on the Atari 2600, but the Commodore version seems to be basically the same. I've never really been sure what you're meant to do here or how to do it, but you play as what I assume is Ash and you have a top down view of the cabin, complete with the swinging chair on the porch which is pretty cool. I spent my time running around, closing doors and windows and occasionally killing demons with the axe that's laying around. Your friends are also in the cabin, but I can't tell if I'm rescuing them or killing them half the time. The controls here are a little frustrating and I did often get stuck on the scenery which wasn't ideal, but this is another game that I kept coming back to just to see if I could beat my previous score or find out what the hell I was meant to do. Yeah, I know I could have looked it up, but that's no fun. I like the crazy enemies that have nothing to do with the movie, like weird arms wobbling around, but still they somehow managed to fit in. I also like the fact that you can see your friends being possessed and turning into demons, that's really cool. It's a good one to waste a few minutes with. He-Man the Movie for the Commodore 64 is a top-down adventure that plays a lot like Gauntlet games. Here, He-Man must find musical chords hidden throughout the town and graveyard that you need to activate a music box and beat Skeletor. Controlling He-Man is easy with the stick and it moves pretty fast. Your one button is to attack and you can just hold it down. Enemies appear out of nowhere and constantly and they're a real pain in the ass. Thankfully you get a decent amount of health and you can collect swords to replenish your health. A lot of the time you can just ignore enemies though, which is usually the best thing to do. Collecting the cords is what you want to do though, and to be honest, it's kind of annoying to do this. The map is one large open world and the cords are hidden in random spots. And the problem I had is that I was just always getting lost, but this could be a me problem. Thankfully, the controls here are decent and the game does move fast, and it looks good enough with He-Man slash Gauntlet crossover vibes. There isn't really any music and you'll just be hearing the sound of enemies shooting at you, which can get a bit tedious. And really, that's all there is to the game. It's not bad, but it's also not great. Ghostbusters came out on most of the 8-bit platforms and surprisingly the C64 version is one of the better ones, not least because you get an awesome Sid version of the classic theme tune that is even a karaoke version. 
the actual gameplay starts off kind of confusing. You've got some money that you have to use to buy a car and equipment that you'll need to bust those ghosts with. Then you get a top-down view of the city where you'll need to go through the flashing buildings to bust those ghosts. I always buy the ghost hoover thing for the car as you'll actually need to drive to get to each of the cool scenes to fight the ghosts and you get to control Ecto-1. There's ghosts on the way which you can nab on the way and then when you get to the building you control two ghostbusters and have to trap the ghost. This can also be a little bit confusing until you get used to it. Basically to start off with you move both characters and then when you press the action button one of them stays in that place. Then you press it again where you want the second person to stand and then you have to position them in a place where you'll be able to lure the ghosts into the trap. It's kind of hard to explain as I'm not very clever but play it a few times and you'll see what I mean. You earn money for the ghosts that you catch so you can upgrade your stuff but if you're good enough, which I'm not, you don't actually need to do that. The game looks alright with a nice mix up in graphics depending on what you're doing and I really love the music here. I've never beaten this game on any system but I think with a bit more practice I will be able to so I'll definitely be going back to it and I recommend you give it a go too. Busting really does make you feel good. Ghostbusters 2, also from Activision, of course follows the plot of the movie and actually does a half decent job of it. Sadly, it doesn't do a good job of just about anything else to do with gameplay or enjoyment. The game starts with you descending into the river of slime and you've got to collect items on your way down, all the while avoiding loads of enemies that will kill you quickly and are stupidly hard to avoid thanks to annoying controls. Eventually, you make it to a shooter level where you control the Statue of Liberty, making your way to the museum. This isn't too bad and the controls are all good enough, in fact I actually quite liked this level, though getting to it is a pain. The graphics here are actually half decent with some cool enemy designs that look right out of the cartoon series rather than the movie, but that's not a bad thing. Unfortunately though, when I beat this second level, the next one just wouldn't load, and to be honest, I wasn't really all that bothered. This game does try to do something different and it almost works, but overall it's just not a very good game. Stick to the first one if you want your fill of ectoplasm. The Goonies is of course one of the best movies from the 80s and the game here is actually pretty good too. You control two of the Goonies at any one time and you have to use them to cooperate in order to escape the level while avoiding the Fratellis. To do this you'll be setting traps and causing distractions, then you gotta change character so they can sneak past and escape. The controls are half decent and it looks pretty cool too, but the music is a little bit annoying. Unfortunately for me, I started having controller issues which meant I stopped being able to change character and of course this happened while I was trying to capture footage too. But trust me, this is actually a pretty cool game and it can be played in two player co-op. I do recommend giving this one a go. The Great Escape is a game I've actually seen a fair bit about and a lot of people seem to really like it, but I'm not really one of them. It's a very slow paced isometric game where you just need to survive in a Nazi concentration camp and eventually escape. Technically it's kind of impressive, if very choppy. The graphics are half decent and although they lack any real colour, there's loads of characters and plenty of places to explore to find items. And that's what you'll spend most of your time doing, wandering around the camp, exploring and collecting items that you can swap between to use to get out. You can't carry loads of items though, so you have to be careful with what you take with you, kind of like in the Dizzy games. The game also runs at a snail's pace when you're outside. Indoors seems to be fine, but it goes down to a crawl when you're in any outdoor areas. For me, I just found the game to be too confusing and cryptic, even when using a guide. It just didn't do anything for me, but hey, maybe you'll like it, and more power to you if you do. Gremlins The Adventure is one of those text adventures where you type in what you want to do and your character inevitably just tells you they don't know what you mean. In fact, in this one, I did actually manage to get somewhere and the game did actually understand what I was trying to tell it around half of the time. Now, it might be because I love the Gremlins franchise, but I actually had a bit of fun with this one and I'm really not a fan of these sorts of games. The graphics here are pretty good and they even have some animation in most of them, which isn't always common in these text adventures. The game does tell you what you can see without needing to be prompted, as well as letting you know where the exits are. This I appreciate, and the game also has the same sense of humour as the movies, giving you fun way to kill the little shits. 
Overall though, I did find that this is still a game that you'll only really enjoy if you're into this sort of game, and I did get bored and stuck after about 40 minutes. So if you like this sort of thing, I'd definitely say give it a go. It seems to be pretty close to the movie, and if you're a loser like me and don't have the patience for these games, maybe give it a miss, as it's not your only option for a Gremlins game on the C64. If action's your thing, then you've got Gremlins by Atari. It's a single screen action game where you have to collect all the mogwai and get them into the cage in the top right of the screen. Meanwhile, you've got to avoid the gremlins that will kill you if you touch them. There's water and food scattered around the levels too, and as we all know, if you feed them after midnight or get them wet, all sorts of havoc will be wreaked. Thankfully, you can pick these up too so the gremlins don't get the chance, or mogwai I should say. Also, you happen to have a massive sword, which, by the way, is from a scene in the movie in case you weren't aware. This is pretty good at killing enemies, so make sure you swing it like a madman. The game looks decent enough, and it can get pretty challenging fairly quickly. Killing enemies can be tricky thanks to some dodgy collision detection, but you soon learn to live with it. You can only carry one mogwai with you at any point in your backpack, so planning your route is crucial, though I found it was a good idea just to try and kill all the gremlins at the start of the level and hope that the mogwai don't eat the food or get wet while you're delivering the other ones to the cages. This tactic kind of worked pretty well for me for the most part. I really enjoyed playing this one and I definitely would recommend giving it a go if you can. Hook wasn't a game I was expecting to see on the C64, and surprisingly, it's not actually too bad. It's still not great though. It's a platform game, and you control the perfect likeness of Robin Williams as you explore Neverland, completing various objectives and trying to decide if you're playing a game or watching the movie. It's hard to tell. The graphics here are amazing. Okay, all right, I'll stop that now. The graphics here are okay. You can tell what everything is meant to be. Also, the controls aren't too bad either, and you generally can do everything you're trying to do. It's all bright and colorful and smooth, which is always nice. Like I mentioned earlier, the levels all tend to have different objectives. Some require you to rescue characters, sometimes you need to find treasure, and sometimes you just need to get to the end. This is actually pretty cool, and it keeps things fresh. The levels are littered with enemies, which you can attack with your knife, which is actually one of the chodiest attacks I've ever seen. It isn't totally useless, but just make sure you're standing still when you're attacking, otherwise you'll end up taking loads of damage. The game definitely doesn't try to follow the movie closely, and it has loads of random stuff in there like dragons and locations that aren't from the film, but that doesn't really matter, as the game itself is kind of fun and plays competently enough. It's not perfect, but it's an okay platform game, and you could do a lot worse. Hudson Hawk is based on the crappy movie starring Bruce Willis, and might even be a rare case of the game being better than the movie. You play as Hudson and you have to steal some priceless art by breaking into the museum and, well, stealing it. The game starts off quite annoying and actually manages to maintain that throughout, but I still found that I wanted to play it. The graphics are pretty decent and the animation is good and everything plays smoothly. You can run and jump as well as throw balls, which are used to defeat enemies, hit switches and also distract dogs. I'd say this is more like a puzzle platform game, requiring you to do basic block pushing puzzles, finding and hitting switches and that sort of thing. But you'll also be combating some pretty tough enemies and some tricky platforming sections that see you avoiding lasers, spikes and deadly smoke. You also have to look out for alarms, as if you trip them, all the security in the area will be ramped up for a short while. It's actually quite an interesting concept, and it's actually not pulled off too badly either. You'll want to take things slowly though, as you die in one hit, and there's loads of stuff on every screen that will kill you. But for me, it had that just one more go factor, which kept me coming back. Check this one out if you don't mind games that require a bit of trial and error, as it's not as bad as a lot of places say it is, especially if you can use the unlimited lives cheat. Next up is Jaws, based on the movie famous for a killer shark that terrorises a small town's beaches. So of course the game sees you as a bloke in a mini submarine shooting the hell out of all marine life available because it's better to be safe than sorry. 
You do occasionally see a shark, which is accompanied by the trademark music, which is nice, but for the most part this is just a confusing mess of a game that forces you to explore a huge underwater world filled with all sorts of dangers way worse than that measly shark. While I understand that it's probably not that easy to make a game based on a shark movie, this is about as far away from the film as you could possibly get. The controls are fine, but the graphics are messy, and half the time I don't know what the hell it is I'm meant to be looking at, let alone know what the hell it is I'm meant to be doing. The best advice I can give you for this game is just to stay out of the water. Neverending Story 2 by Cinevox is an action platform game that has a fair bit going for it. The graphics are good, with some really cool looking action stages as well as third person flying stages, and the music here is pretty good too. The gameplay can't quite keep up though, while it controls ok, the levels are often confusing to navigate and the enemies that can't be defeated have a really annoying habit of boxing you into areas that you've got no way of getting away from, forcing you to lose a life. But, of course, the more you play, the more you get used to it. If you die, you'll see the world of Fantasia slowly disappearing, which is cool, but you'll likely be seeing that a lot, so get used to it. You'll need to do a fair amount of exploring too, which can be tedious, even in the first stage as you go through doors to areas that all just look the same, making it really hard to navigate and know where you've been. It's all about memorization, and there's no real indication of what you need to do or where to go. This is likely to be deliberate though, as you can beat the whole thing in about 10 minutes when you do know what you're doing, which most of the time I don't. This isn't a bad game though, and it's one that I actually plan on going back to to see if I can finish it all the way through. Oh, and yeah, I do know there is a game based on the first Neverending Story, but it's one of those text adventures and I'll be honest, I just didn't want to play it. So I'll save it for part 2. Sorry. Now we're getting to the good stuff. Here is Platoon, based on the classic movie starring just about all the 8-listers of the 80s. Here you take control of a soldier who has to fight his way through the dangerous Vietnamese jungles taking out enemies and destroying enemy bases. The game looks fantastic and does a great job of looking like a dense jungle. Later levels see you head into underground tunnels and then later you even have to take part in a nighttime raid where you have to fire flares into the air to light up the scenery to see the enemies. These look really cool. Eventually you're back in the jungle to take out any enemy bases. All the stages look and play brilliantly. Each one is different. You've got side scrolling action stages, first person gallery maze shooter stages and third person stages like in Contra 2. They're all fun and have interesting mechanics to them and amazingly they all play well and I personally don't have a favourite stage because I enjoyed them all. It's tough though with plenty of enemies and hazards to stop you on your mission but it also is perfectly beatable unlike many of the games on this list. This is one that I highly recommend playing and I would probably say it's the best game in this video. The Commodore 64 version of Predator is a side-scrolling action game, but you can move up and down, kind of like Streets of Rage. You again play as Arnie and you make your way through the jungles and villages taking on enemy soldiers and their traps until you get to the Predator himself. What's surprising is that the film actually follows the movie kind of well. As you progress you'll come across your various dead teammates and you can pick up their weapons to use. Each weapon has limited ammo, but I never found myself running out. Enemies appear out of nowhere and they'll often start shooting at you before you can even see them, which is a little bit annoying, but for the most part their bullets are easy to dodge. Graphically the game looks pretty decent and it all moves at a reasonable pace and everything is smooth. The controls here are ok, but as the C64 only has one button, you'll need to use a combination of keyboard and joystick to get things done, which can be a bit annoying. Overall though, it is a decent movie license for the C64, and I would say it's worth giving a go. Predator 2 on the C64 is a rail shooter. The screen is constantly scrolling and enemies come at you from all over the place. Just point your cursor on them and shoot. Simple. Well, not quite. The sheer number of enemies make this game actually pretty damn hard. There's health pickups and more powerful weapons that you can collect by shooting scenery and they do help a little bit, but even getting past the first level is tough. You've also got to look out for civilians that run across the screen. Shoot too many of these and it's game over. The graphics here are ok for the system and everything is actually really smooth. Even controlling your cursor is very responsive and it's not too hard to hit even the small enemies. 
you see the predator appear every now and then to remind you that this is a predator game as otherwise you could probably just put any generic name and you would never know. The biggest issue with the game though is that the levels will go on for way too long with most being over 5 minutes which doesn't sound like a lot but with the constant barrage of enemies I just needed a bit of a break every now and then. And that's about it. It's a standard rail shooter. It's fine I suppose but don't go out of your way to play it. Rambo First Blood Part 2 is a cool little top-down shooter where your only mission is to kill those pesky non-Americans for not being American. And rightly so, eh? We can't have that. So you'll run around a few levels that are packed with enemies all over the place and you'll be using knives, guns and grenades to take them down. Now I've heard that this is actually a really short game that can be beaten in about 5 minutes, which actually makes sense as to why it's so damn tough. You've got enemies coming out of the wazoo and they're all over you to make your life a misery. But then again you are trying to murder them all so you can't really blame them can you? There's only a handful of levels that require you to kill, maim and murder as well as occasionally rescue people. The controls are actually smooth and responsive and the graphics do a pretty good job while not being anything particularly special. And even though it has a really cheap difficulty I do kind of like this game. Check it out if you want something to kill a few minutes or a few hundred Viet Cong. Rambo 3 also got a game on the C64 which plays similarly to First Blood Part 2, what a stupid name, but is a lot more fleshed out. Here you have to explore the enemy base to find Colonel Troutman, he's half man, half trout. The graphics here are decent and they really remind me of the NES games of the time with decent colour and some good animation. You'll be unlocking and exploring compounds and enemy bases where you can find weapons and items to unlock doors and deactivate electric fences so you can get that bit further. You can also find other items like med packs and other things to help you get out of trouble along the way. There's plenty of enemies here to kill of course, and the most of them follow a simple pattern, which once you learn them, does make progressing a lot easier. You get a few weapons that do use ammo like pistols, machine guns and grenades, but you do also have a knife when you're out of ammo. This is still quite effective, but you do need to get up close and personal in order to use it. The whole game is basically a large maze and it can be hard to get around, especially as I found there's random invisible walls all over the place, which I really couldn't tell if they were meant to be there or if it was a glitch. This made getting around a real pain in the ass and meant I didn't take too long before I lost interest. Having said that though, this is a better game than the first one and I'll need to come back to it when I've got more time to see if I can get that bit further. The metallic man on the beat, Robocop, got a game for each of his first three movies and we're going to take a look at all three of them. No really, we are. They're all from Ocean, which is a shame, and the first one sees you take to the streets in a moderately okay platform shooter. You've got to fight your way through hordes of enemies that just keep spawning out of nowhere firing bullets at you that are impossible to see and mostly to avoid. Luckily you do get a fair few health kits along the way as well as different weapons like a spread shot but honestly these don't actually help all that much. Everything does look pretty decent though actually with good graphics and animation. You can shoot in most directions and in later levels you'll see you exploring larger areas with a pretty strict time limit. This game I found really difficult which is probably what you should expect from any ocean game but of course it's not really a fair difficulty it's just that you're bombarded by enemies and at the same time you've got a very short time limit that's barely enough to make it through the stage. In fact, unless you have the hacked version, this game is actually impossible to complete and that's on purpose from the developers as they never actually finished the game, so they made it so you can't beat the last level. And people thought it was just nowadays that companies are dicks. It has been fixed though by fans of the game, but this here is the original version that I've had on tape since the early 90s. The footage here is the furthest I've ever actually managed to get, and although there are times when I think I like this game, then when I play it again for more than 10 minutes I remember that it's actually just an unfair pain in the ass. Do play it if you have to, but I wouldn't really recommend it. The sequel, Robocop 2, should be an improvement, but amazingly it actually manages to be worse in just about every way. The only improvement is the inclusion of a proper jump button, other than that you have to do battle with much worse graphics, sloppy controls, terrible platforming sections and very dodgy level design. It's still an action platform game, but everything is just so slippery here and it's a real reliance on precision jumping that just isn't fun, or often possible, to actually pull off. 
I can only make it to the second level here before getting too frustrated at the poor, confusing level design combined with the slippery control. I don't know how they managed to make this one worse than the first, but they did a great job of it. Safe to say, I would not buy this for a dollar. And then there's Robocop 3, which is now a first person rail shooter, kind of like Die Hard 2. You get some big sprites on screen that look like they've escaped from the Simpsons, and you'll be pointing your cursor on their heads and blowing them away, or arresting them as the game insists on saying. You do get an indication of where the perp is that you need to capture, but this didn't seem to make any difference for me as the level seemed to go on forever. If you do have the perseverance to make it through this stage, which lasts about 10 minutes, you get to play some mediocre action stages that play a lot more like the first two games. And while they're actually definitely an improvement, they still aren't really fun to play. The graphics are better than Robocop 2, but still aren't quite up there with the first game, which is just a bit strange. However, this is definitely the best of the three C64 Robocop games if you ask me, which you didn't, but oh well. And finally for today, we're going to take a look at a double bill of Arnold Schwarzenegger games. First up is Red Heat, based on the Russian bashing action movie. The whole game is a side-scrolling beat-em-up where you play as a naked Arnie, and no, I'm actually not joking. The game starts out in the scene from the movie where he's at the bathhouse kicking the crap out of a load of bad guys while his shiny butt is hanging out, and for the entire game, you don't bother to put on clothes. Sadly, you don't get to see his Terminator though, as the whole game is played from the waist up, which is just kind of strange, and you slowly walk across the screen attacking everyone you see. As you may have guessed, to attack you hold the fire button and then each direction on the joystick does a different attack. I found that the headbutt is the most effective attack, so basically spent the entire game headbutting everyone I saw, which is pretty much fun for all of about 4 minutes. The graphics here are good with huge on-screen sprites, and you can actually tell that you're playing as Arnie, which is nice. There are some strange minigame things where you've got to waggle the joystick, but I wasn't actually able to beat any of these as they were stupidly difficult. Also, the levels just go on for ages. There's only a handful of them, but they each take 10 or so minutes to complete, which doesn't sound like a lot by today's standards, but trust me, they really do drag on. And each level is basically identical, but with maybe a different enemy sprite thrown in. When I first started playing this one, I really thought it was great, but then after about 15 minutes, I realised it's tolerable at best. But give it a go though, you might really like it. And our final game for today is The Running Man. Yep, based on the movie where Arnie has to take part in a kill or be killed TV show. That movie is awesome. The game is not. It's a very confused game that has dodgy graphics, terrible controls and bad hit detection. So yeah, it ticks all of the boxes for a movie license game. You have to go through various levels that are similar to the parts of the movie, taking out the stalkers who are the bad guys in there sent to hunt you down. But really, it's the collision detection that's the biggest danger of the game, as making simple jumps and actions is almost impossible. Your character bounces off the scenery like some kind of muscular pinball, and doing any kind of precision platforming is just not possible with the awful control. There's enemies and bosses in the levels, and fighting them is the same as basically all the games here. You hold the action button, and the different directions are different attacks. But it just seems random if you actually bother hitting the enemies or not. Of course though, they have no trouble kicking your ass with little to no effort. If you do manage to kill the bad guys, the chances are that you'll immediately then jump down a hole thanks to the crap control and have to start the level all over again anyway. In between levels, you do get a small puzzle to complete with a very strict time limit. These are annoyingly tough too, and you rarely have enough time. It's just a case of matching the two patterns on the screen, but it's harder than it looks. At least it was for me, and like I said earlier, I'm dumb. Overall though, this game is just not fun to play. The graphics are almost appealing, but as soon as you start playing, you realise that they must have sneezed this game out in a very short time, and they really can't have quality checked it. This is another one to steer well clear of. So there you go, loads of games based on movies for the Commodore 64. 
Of course, there's loads more for me to cover in the future, so please let me know what ones I should be checking out for part two of this topic. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We've got loads of cool content for you to enjoy, and you can see on screen now where you can find us. Now, all that's left for me to say is thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time.